All right, now Genesis chapter 10, it's a lot of genealogy here. It tells us essentially what we get here is the, is the kind of more direct, immediate um, descendants of Noah. Noah and his three sons. So we get these three families of um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? Those are the sons of Noah. And basically what we see here is just more confirmation that the world, the, the flood was worldwide. All the people were, were killed, were destroyed, and the entire earth was repopulated based off of this family, off of Noah's family and his children. And we kind of see how like um, the Bible starts to delineate here the tribes that are set up based on those three sons. And, and we see the people involved and you'll start to recognize these names as you go throughout the Bible. And um, cities in the Bible were typically named after people. Um, typically the person who founded it. So it's like an ancestor's name. And that's why you'll see a lot of these names repeated throughout the, t the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. Because these are the people who founded cities. These are the people who started them because they were the first ones in those areas and they started to spread um, throughout the earth. So let's get started here going in, in verse number one. The Bible says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. And that's what this whole chapter is about. That's what he's given us this, you know, this first verse. Verse number two says, The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Medei, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach and Tyrus. So some of those names look familiar in there. Um, maybe they do, maybe they don't to you. Tubal is mentioned quite a bit. Tyrus is Tyre, you know, the city of Tyre, the city of Tyre and Zidon um, were, were cities mentioned all throughout the Old and New Testament. Um, that's Tyrus. And then um, Magog. And I'm going to focus a little bit on Magog for, you know, for just to begin with, because honestly, there's, this is something that, um, Oftentimes when, when the Bible doesn't speak a lot about something, you'll find people that create all kinds of doctrines and they want to give you, oh, all of the secrets from the Bible and all these secret prophecies and all this new stuff, right? People who claim to have all this extra knowledge of the Bible and, and you don't really understand it and I understand this and I'm going to show you everything. They'll, they'll pick topics that really aren't covered very much in the Bible, right? It's, and one of these subjects is Gog and Magog. Now, if you've looked at or read or studied or you know, listened to different people doing the prophecy talks, often there, there's entire books and sections and everything is dedicated to Gog and Magog and they'll have all of these different interpretations and Gog is going to be this city and Magog is that and they try to apply it to like present day and all this other stuff. But be weary of, of all of that teaching when the Bible does not speak very much to the, the subject at all. We're going to look at, it, it's actually the um, Magog, you know, this Gog and Magog is essentially only found in like four places in the Bible. It's found right here in Genesis 10. We see Magog, which Magog is a person, right? It's a descendant of uh, Japheth is who we're looking at in these first verses. So it's obviously a person who builds a city, starts a city, and, and his family and his descendants are all part of that city, and it's called Magog. But um, obviously this has nothing to do with end times prophecy right here. This is just telling us the person that existed and where he came from. But um, the, par the portions of scripture that do deal with that are Ezekiel 38, 39, and Revelation 20. Now, we're not going to go and read um, Ezekiel 38 and 39. You could flip over to Revelation 20 because I'm going to show you something out of that with Gog and Magog. But, um, and, and, you know, ultimately for what I'm trying to teach tonight, it doesn't matter too much what is found in Ezekiel 38 and 39 regarding Gog and Magog. Um, we got to remember, especially with end times prophecy, when you're coming up with your doctrine, when you're forming what you believe, about stuff, you, got, you have to recognize, at least, in the Old Testament, there's a few different things that could be going on. One thing, it could be prophesying something that is a short-term event that is going to happen soon. And that's going to happen locally, and it's literally just going to happen to like 
the people of Israel or whatever at that time, where an invading army is going to come and there's going to be a war and whatever else, and it's, and it's just prophesying something that's going to happen in the, in the short term, right? Five years, ten years, something like that, wh wh whatever it may be. There's a lot of prophecies like that in the Old Testament. Now, oftentimes what you'll have is, yes, you have the short term, but then it also has applications of something a little bit longer term. You'll have applications of, a, uh, of the first coming of Jesus Christ. And then sometimes you'll also have prophecies that would be pertaining to second coming of Jesus Christ or other like way and times future events. Now, you can have one of those things, two of those things, all three of those things, all in the sections that you're reading. So it can be a little bit dark. It could be a little bit mysterious. And this is where people, this is why... You can have so many different teachings on this and people go really in depth because it's honestly not always that clear. And when you start making applications, you say, well, I think this is talking about an end times event. Um, okay, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong or inherently wrong or anything like that. You just have to be careful that when you're looking at it, what's it saying? Now, in the New Testament, and since we're, we have the entire Bible at our disposal to, to look at and to study from, and I've mentioned this time and time again, but I'm going to repeat myself again here, is that we need to, especially with the, the end times prophecy, look at the new stuff. When God has given us a revelation, when God has revealed something to us, not like it was in the days of Daniel when it was dark sayings and, and he didn't even understand everything that he saw and what he was looking at and, and what he was told and didn't quite get the prophecy. And it was given directly to him. And, and we're reading it later and a lot of this stuff, you know, we might not understand it completely. But when we have the light of the New Testament, where God has revealed so much more unto us, we can, we can look at that and apply it backwards to the Old Testament prophecies. Obviously, you can do that with, with the foreshadowings of Jesus Christ with his first coming. You can go back to all these scriptures. The disciples were doing that, and we have that record where they're quoting Isaiah, they're quoting the Psalms, you know, they're quoting all these different scriptures saying, hey, Christ fulfilled this prophecy. Hey, Christ fulfilled this prophecy. Whereas... Before, you might look at that and not quite know what it's talking about. Is this talking about the, you know, the second coming of Christ? And they were even confused about that. When they thought that Jesus Christ was coming, he, they thought he was coming to rule and reign and to set up his kingdom here on earth. That's what they thought. And some people were even ready to go make him king because they were just confused on the prophecies and on the scriptures and what scriptures applied to his first coming and then what scriptures applied to his second coming. So when he comes again, after he comes again, he is going to reign on this earth. Sit down in your seat. He's going to come to this earth. He's going to set up a kingdom on earth. And that is going to happen. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And we're going to rule and reign with him. And, um, but that hasn't happened yet, obviously. That's something that is, is going to happen. And this is what I'm saying. So when you look at the scriptures, you know, people like to go in all kinds of directions with these things, with these topics, Gog and Magog. I just want to show you where it is in Revelation 20. Because... This at least can give us a good timeline of events of when these things are happening with Gog and Magog. So that when you do go back and read Ezekiel 38 and 39, and it's bringing up Gog and Magog, you know, again, because Magog is a real person, it was a real city, it's a real place, there are events, I think, that were happening in, the, in Ezekiel that were relevant to that time period. But I do also believe that there is... I mean, it, it's pretty clear it's talking about prophetic events as well. It's about the sun and moon being darkened. You know, it talks about the, you know, these types of similar events that are prophesied in the New Testament as well to, as future events. But what we see here is with Gog and Magog, uh, look at verse number, if you're in Revelation 20, look at verse number 7. Uh, look, let's go jump up a little bit higher. Let's look at verse number, let's go to verse number 4. Verse number 4. In the first few verses, he sees the, the, um, the devil gets bound and uh, the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire in Revelation 20. Then verse number four says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ and for the word of God, in which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So in Revelation 20, this is where we're seeing, hey, those people that, that went through the tribulation, 
They didn't receive the mark of the beast. They came through. They were saved. They were martyred. It says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And this is where we're at now. We're, we're talking about the millennial reign of Christ. Verse number five. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So he's talking about that first, the rapture, the first resurrection is when Jesus Christ comes back. Those that are asleep, those that were dead in Christ rise first. And then us which are alive and remain are gathered together with him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the rapture. And then he's going to set up his kingdom. We're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But during this reign and during this kingdom, there are other people that are still unsaved that are going to be on this earth. And there are going to be people getting saved. And, and you know, people who... Um, who are on this earth and they're unsaved or whatever, and they, they end up dying during this thousand years, right? There's going to be people still um, um, being born and living and dying. It says the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years are finished. So basically at that first resurrection, it's kind of go back to the way things were like they are right now. Right? When people die and you know, the, the, their spirit, you know, they don't go anywhere. Um, there's going to be another resurrection. And, and the second resurrection is going to be like a resurrection of the dead, where the dead are going to be raised and judged by God and cast in the lake of fire. But anyways, I don't want to get too far into that because it says here, uh, we're talking about Gog and Magog. Verse number six, he says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there we get another reference to reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So this whole time Lord, that Christ is reigning for a thousand years, Satan's locked up. He's not going out and deceiving the nations. He's not doing what he does right now. He's not accusing people. He's locked up. Okay, but when the thousand years comes to an end, Satan is going to be loosed just for a short time. And he is going to go out and deceive people. Look at verse number eight. He says, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God of heaven and destroyed them. So this is Satan's final battle, right? When Satan's loosed out of prison, he finally, he goes out and tries to round everyone up that's not saved. And because there's going to be a literal, the new Jerusalem, you know, there's, there's going to be Christ reigning out of Jerusalem, out of the holy city, and, and we're going to be ruling and reigning with them. And the earth is still going to have people, still going to be inhabited, and people are going to be not saved and they're going to, the, the devil's going to come out and deceive them and try to bring them out to fight against the, the saints, against Jesus Christ. And God just going to, Jesus is going to wipe them out. Just fire's going to come out of heaven and phew, gone, right? And the reason why I'm bringing all of this up is because that event, like this event where he goes to Gog and Magog, happens after the millennial reign. So, and what so many people get confused on is they try to look at events that are happening in the world today and saying, oh, maybe this is Gog and Magog and maybe, the, you know, and that's what this is talking about and try to make all these applications. That's not. When, when, when the prophetic events of Gog and Magog, clearly in Revelation 20, this happens twice. It mentions the thousand years reigning with Christ. And then after this is when Satan comes out and, you know, deceives these people. And then it's final judgment. Heaven and earth is going to be destroyed. Everything changes after that. But um, that's where we're at. So don't, don't get too caught up in these prophecies with, uh, you know, with Gog and Magog. Like I said, I'm not going to turn to Ezekiel 38 and 39, but those are the only other places you're going to find a reference to Gog or Magog is going to be in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation 20. Not very many places. And we saw there, I mean, that's mentioned one time in the book of Revel in Revelation 20. And that's what it's referring to. And if you go back and look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, you'll see that it fits in just fine with that timeline of events. But um, you'll also see other things going on that, that, you know, there's, there's different things that's prophesying. So you don't want to get confused by that. We have the, the, you know, the book of Revelation to tell us exactly the way things are going to be a lot more clearly. 
But continuing on here, that was verse number two. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. So what's interesting here in verse number five, this is the first reference of the word Gentiles. Okay, and again, another topic that, um, that, that has come up with some people who are really interested in the, the, you know, the physical seed of Israel and, and, and that type of thing, these Hebrew roots type people are, um, you know, just people have kind of bizarre beliefs on, on the, the physical seed being so important where over and over again throughout the Bible we see that that's not important, especially in the New Testament. But here in verse number five, be quiet. In verse number five we see Gentiles mentioned for the first time and it's in reference to all the sons of Japheth. This is who it's ascribed to. So we're going to see um, when it talks about the sons of Shem, that's where the term Semitic comes from because his name Shem could be, it's also referred to as Sem depending on the spelling and where you see it in the Bible. And people will say, if you're anti-Jew, right? People call you anti-Semitic. That word Semitic just derives from Sem because the Jews' lineage comes from Shem. So you have the Semites from Shem. You have um, the Japheth's children were known as the Gentiles. And when, so when you see the word Gentile, it's referring to this lineage, this family, this tribe of Japheth. Okay, this is where the Gentiles are from. And um, flip, if you would, just over to Romans 3, because there's so much scripture about this. Um, the Gentiles in general, when you, when you look at scripture, especially like these people that we saw here, these sons of Japheth, there's lots of famous cities that derived from them. And they're also like, um, they were real powerful and they were, they were real mighty and there was, um, you know, big battles and, and these were the, the cities of the Gentiles and you see the names multiple times throughout the Bible. But um, there is also, and this is kind of seems to be the way human nature works anyways, is we're, we're sort of tribal in the sense that people who look different from us or from different areas or from different families, you know, we have this sense of belonging to our family and not wanting to have anything to do with people who are different from us. And this is kind of a natural instinct that we have. It's gone all throughout history. And sometimes it got to the point, it got to the point in Jesus' day where the Jews thought that they were way, you know, like so much more special than the Gentiles. And they were so much more special than everyone else around them. They were God's chosen people. And, you know, they wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. They wouldn't have anything to do with the Gentiles. Remember, people were appalled, like, you went under the Gentiles? They were saying, what, is, is Jesus going to go under the Gentiles? When Jesus said, you know, and where I go, thither can you not come. Like, you can't go where I'm going. And they're like, where is he going to go? Unto the Gentiles? Because they're like, there's no way they would go unto the Gentiles, right? And this is the way that they viewed the Gentiles at that time. But if you turn to Romans chapter 3, we're going to see what is the difference between a Jew versus a Gentile. Because obviously if you go back far enough, they're cousins, right? There's, they're, they're family. And if you go back far enough for anybody, we all can stem back to be cousins, brothers, sisters, whatever. Because you trace it back to... Hey, Japheth had the, the children, which are called the Gentiles, and Shem had his children that, that were the Jews, right? And, and the Jews are only a small part of that because he had other children, too, that are part of that, that are Semites, right? So, um, Romans chapter 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So he's saying, well, what advantage is, is there even to be in a Jew? What is a prophet? What, why, why, is it, why would it be a good thing to be called a Jew? He says, well, there is an advantage for that. It is profitable because, and this is why he said chiefly because, this is the, the main reason why it, why it would be considered a good thing to be a Jew, is because the oracles of God 
were given unto them. God worked through the Jews. God, God delivered his words. He sent his prophets. Everything was done using the Jews as a people. And the only reason he chose them is not because they were so special, but because Abraham, right? Abraham was a friend of God. Isaac, Israel, right? I mean, these were people that, that, that God blessed. These were individuals. And because he blessed them, by default, their children and their ancestors, he made promises unto them. He liked them so much, said, hey, Abraham was a friend of God because Abraham was, was God loved him so much. He gave him a promise that essentially Jesus Christ was going to come out of one of his descendants, right? The Savior of the earth. He had to come out of somewhere. He had to come from somebody. And, and God chose them. And this is the people that he chose to be, you know, the lighthouse, to have the truth of God's word, to shine in a dark world. And God always wanted everyone to be saved, but this is the way he chose to do it. He's going he's gonna to have an establishment. He's going to have his tabernacle that was going to be mobile. And then later he had the temple. And this was the, 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 the foundation. This was like a, a solid rock for, for people to come to, to hear the truth and to know the truth where God was giving out his word. Okay, and um, so that's what Paul's saying here in, in Romans 3, verses 1 and 2. Well, hey, there is, there is an advantage to that. If you're a Jew, you're born in that land, or even if you become a Jew, hey, you get to hear the, the prophecies of God. You get to hear the truth. Just like there's, there's a benefit for children being born in a Christian home. There's a benefit to that. You get to hear, if you have godly parents, you got someone, people who know the Bible and teach the Bible and read the Bible, hey, they're going to have an advantage over other people who aren't hearing the truth. There is an advantage. Now, does that mean that, that you know, God just is unfair and that you know, God made things? This, no. God wants everyone to hear the truth, and, but, but he's given us free will at the same time. So some people have different struggles than others. We all have our own struggles. And there's definitely an advantage to being around the truth and be able to hear it more frequently. But, um, but that's where it ends. It's not that... Oh, I'm so special because God chose me to be born into this, into this family and, and as a Jew. And just because I'm a Jew, now I'm so much better than everyone else. And this is the mentality that we're having. And this is all he's saying is that no, that's not has nothing to do with your physical descendancy. You just happen to be advantaged by chance because you're around God's truth. But look at verse number 9 of Romans 3. So and he, and he establishes this very clearly. What then? Are we better than they? Referring to the Gentiles, are we better than them? He says, no, in no wise. We're not better than them. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. He's saying, no, we're not better than them. We're sinners too. The Gentiles are sinners. We're all sinners. We all deserve to pay the punishment for our sins. We're not any better than them. That's what he's saying. Look at verse number 10. He says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. He's making it abundantly clear. You can't rely on your ancestry to think that you're good and you're better than someone else because you're a sinner too. And anytime you're, you think you're just better than somebody else, Think about how you look in God's eyes. Because God sees a sinner. Hopefully he sees a sinner saved by grace, but you're still a sinner. And if it was just based on you and on your merit, you're not doing good. You know, you're not righteous. You're only righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is received as a free gift. Jump down to verse number 28 of Romans 3. Therefore we conclude. So again, the conclusion. Ever he says, oh, this whole chapter, you can read it later in context. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So in verse 1 he was saying, what does, a you know, what does a prophet to be a Jew? Sure, a prophet to be a Jew. Because you get to hear God's word. You, you receive that truth. But... He's the same God of the Jews, the same God of the Gentiles. There's no different gods. And he will justify the Gentiles just as much as he'll justify the Jews. It's all through faith. Since it's not based on where you're from, who you are, what you do. 
It's based on whether or not you put your faith in Christ. And um, that's what makes us all um, one, and, and there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Uh, Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, look at verse number 25. We're going to see just a few more evidence of this, a few more scriptures that have evidence of this. Um, I know it's real common and, and, and easy truth to, to get, but there are those out there that for whatever reason think that, that the children of Israel are just a special people. And they've got this, this, you know, through the world, through Satan, through, you know, false prophets, through all kinds of different people thinking that the Jews are some special people. That they are just this, this real special people. No, they're sinners too. Just like, just like you and me. And whether or not they were born as a descendant of Shem or of Japheth doesn't matter. Or of Ham for that matter. Doesn't matter. We all have the opportunity to put our faith in God. Some people just, just have been given a little bit more than others just based on where they've, they've been born. Like my children are going to have a lot more than I ever received as a child growing up because they're being taught the words of, of God from a young age, which I wasn't. And, um, and I praise God for that, that this is going to happen. And that's, um, but that's just is the way it is. Does that mean I wasn't able to come to Christ because I didn't, wasn't in the best of situations? No. Everybody can. Everyone's got the opportunity. Everyone has that free will. Uh, look at verse number 25 of Romans 9. He says, As he saith also in Ozi, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Again, just clearly saying, look, the people who were not called God's people, because the Gentiles were not called God's people in times past. In the Old Testament, they were not called God's people. God's people were the Jews. right? That's, God's people were the ones that he had chosen. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. right? That, that's who he chose. They were called God's people. But he's saying, the Gentiles which follow not after righteous, they have attained to righteous. They are righteous. Because they have faith. Because they put their faith in Christ. Uh, he says, but Israel, verse number 31, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? I mean, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So he's saying, isn't it ironic? The people that are called God's people, they're not even righteous. They think that they're righteous in their heart. They think that they're some special people and that God's going to acknowledge them and that for some reason they think God's going to be a respecter of persons and accept them in heaven just because they were physically born of the seed of Abraham. But he's saying Israel hasn't obtained it because they didn't do it through faith, because they didn't put their faith in Christ. They rejected Christ. They think that by their good deeds and by obedience to the law, they're going to be saved and in so thinking that they're going to go to hell. They are not God's people because they didn't seek it by faith. But the Gentiles are God's people. I don't know why people can't turn to Romans 9 and say, you know, oh, well, the Gentiles are special. They're God's people because they are. But no, 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 no. It's just Israel. Israel are God's people. The people who are in the United Nations created land right now are, are God's people and they're special and God's got a special plan for them and they're going to have, you know, a completely separate salvation path because they're God's special people. No, the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. It says the exact opposite. Romans chapter 9 says they are not righteous because they did not seek it by faith. And then 1 uh, Corinthians 12, 13 sums it all up. He says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or, or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. God's Holy Spirit brings us together. We're born again. We are God's children and all brothers and sisters in Christ, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, Greek, bond, free, male, female, doesn't matter. When you're born of the Spirit, in that Spirit, we're all one. We're all, we're all of one family. It doesn't matter where you descended from, Jew or Gentile. But it's interesting that we see this, though, in Genesis. Go flip back to Genesis chapter 10 that we see the, uh, the family of Japheth. That's because these names all have meanings, these terms, right? Because I've often wondered that before. What, is Gen what does it even mean to be a Gentile? And I often thought that Gentile just meant absolutely everybody who's not a Jew. But 
that's not really what it means. I mean, it's, it's kind of used as a broad term, but there are a lot of descendants of Japheth that, that are Gentiles, right? Um, and that's, that's what it's referring to here, the same way that, that the sons of Shem are Semitic, right? It has a meaning, um, but it's not even just Jew, because as you go up, Jews, and Jews, really, the word Jew comes from the people who are of the southern kingdom of Judea. Judea, do you see where the, the, the word Jew comes from? That's not even all of the children of Israel. Right? Israel, there's, there's 12 tribes in Israel. And the, the southern kingdom of Judea only encompassed approximately three tribes. There was half tribe of Manasseh. There was approximately three tribes down there. And the rest is the northern kingdom of Israel. And, but they were all children of Israel. But the reason why the Jews came out as being somewhat special is because when the northern kingdom got taken over before the southern kingdom did, they, they ended up intermingling with the, with the heathen, with the lands that had conquered them and, and corrupted their, their bloodline, right? They, they corrupted their genealogy. So they were, and that's another reason why they were looked down upon. That's when the, the Samaritans were looked down upon because that's where, you know, Samaria was in the northern kingdom and the Samaritans were of Samaria and people would look down on them because they weren't pure. They weren't pure children of Israel anymore. But the Jews were. So the people who were claiming to be Jews, they would have their genealogy and their ancestry and everything else. Now, they had gotten corrupted too um, when they got taken over, but when they went back into the Promised Land, um, you can read Ezra and Nehemiah, how some people weren't allowed to do service because they couldn't prove their lineage and things like that. But... Um, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, but with the Samaritans, you think of the story of the Good Samaritan and why that's so important and why it has that meaning of, um, you know, when Jesus said there was a man, you know, he was taken by, by thieves, there was robbers, they beat him up, they left him in the ditch to die, and a priest walks by and he goes basically on the other side of the street, like, oh, I don't have anything to do with him. A priest, right? A priest of God, someone who should be a holy person, someone who should care about someone who's beat up and bloodied in the street and have compassion on him and help him. And then, and then a Levite walks by, right? Another person who's supposed to be in the service of God, someone who's supposed to be doing what's right and holy and righteous and a good person. Yeah, they walk by and they say, I don't want to deal with that. I got, I got other things to do. And then he says, but a Samaritan. And that's why he says a Samaritan because they were looked down upon. A Samaritan. Someone who you probably won't even want to eat lunch with because they're a Samaritan, because you're so much better than them. A certain Samaritan came and he helped them out. And he, you know, healed up his wounds and, you know, cleaned up his wounds and, and gave him uh, the innkeeper money so he could take care of him and make sure he got better on his own because he had compassion on this man that, that, that had the uh, um, misfortune of, of, of all, that, all that stuff happening to him. And that's why the Samaritan was used in that parable because people looked down on him and saying, look, he's, he's proving an extra point there of, you know, you think you're so righteous just because of your birth, and that means nothing. You know, who you are as a person, whether or not you have faith in Christ, that is what matters to God, not who you were born from. So can we learn a lot from these genealogies? Yes, we can, but are they the most important thing in the Bible? No, we're, you know, we avoid endless genealogies and things like that, but it is interesting to learn these truths. So you could, you know, later on, especially when terms are used, you know where they're coming from. As we'll see in a little bit, you know, I went into Canaan quite a bit last week and um, the curse that he received from Noah because of what he had done and, and the perversions that he did. It's no surprise, though, that when we read, and I'm not quite there yet. I'll skip ahead to that right now. That's fine. Um, it's not really much of a surprise. I don't even have it in my notes, so... When you start to look at, and I, I covered some of this last week, but when you look at the people who were, who were descended from Canaan, or from Ham, right? His children, he was a pervert, and it screws up his children. And, and it kind of puts them off on, on the wrong foot to begin with. Just like my children are, are, are starting off on the right foot because they have someone who's going to teach them the Bible and give them the truth and love them and you know, nurture them and protect them and teach them and everything else that, that's going to be good for them. Well, not everyone's born into a family like that. Some people are born into bad families where maybe their father is a pervert, right? It happens and it's sad and uh, it's terrible. And that's why God has his, the some of the punishments that he does with the death penalty. And, you know, a guy just needs to be out of there so he can't just ruin his children and anyone else for that matter. But um, 
those people still have a chance though. Just because you start off maybe with a little bit more of a disadvantage, you still have free will. You can still hear the truth. You can still receive the truth and, and, and become righteous just as much as anyone else by putting your faith in Christ. But um, we see here with um, Ham, let's see, in, uh, we'll skip down to well, verse 6. I guess we're, I mean, we're kind of in there, but I wanted to cover uh, Nimrod. So verse 6 starts with the sons of Ham. And we'll just start reading here. It says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Ramah and Sabtika and the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. We'll get back to that in a minute. And then um, jump down to verse number 15. Because we'll see that, you know, the, the descendants of Canaan. Verse number 15, And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Zemorite, and the Hamathite. And afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. So if you notice there, you know, Hivite, Jebusite, Amorite, um, these are all the people that got kicked out of the, it was the land of Canaan, right? I mean, Canaan was the, the, the forefather of, of these descendants. But these were all the people that were extremely wicked. And again, I covered that last week, how um, in Leviticus it says that they did all those wicked things that God made his law against, and especially all the, the death penalty sentences. Hey, they did all of them. And they were wicked people, and Canaan brought forth wicked descendants. But look at, it says the border in verse 19, And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Geza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, even unto Lasha. So is it any surprise that we see Sodom and Gomorrah listed here as one of the bordering towns of the Canaanites? Not at all. I mean, um, Ham was a pervert. Canaan was cursed as a result of that. And we see here just, just a lot of wickedness being spawned from that family. But um, let's go back. I want to cover now Nimrod. And again, I already mentioned with Gog and Magog, when you have something where there's not really much said about it in the Bible, it is what it is. You don't need to start going to these extra biblical sources to get all kinds of, oh, oh man, you got to understand, Nimrod this, and Nimrod that. You know, it's like, look, I believe the Bible to be true. The Bible is the only guaranteed source of truth, right? Now, there's a lot of things said about Nimrod, and maybe they're true, Maybe they're not. I don't know. I'm not standing up here saying, yeah, all this stuff you hear about Nimrod is false. I don't know that. But the thing is, I, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I don't know that and neither do you. And just because, you know, um, jo Josephus wrote about it or just because some of these other old writings reference Nimrod and they have these stories about Nimrod and stuff, it doesn't make it true just because it's old. Everything that's been written down was written by a person that's telling a story that has a perspective that has their version of the truth and of the events and things like that. I mean, it's happening today. Think about with the internet. Internet. Hey, you have a potential to get a lot of truth, but is everything on the internet the truth? No. <laughs> it is the majority of the stuff on the internet the truth? No. No way. No way. Now, that's why people say you can't believe everything you read on the internet. And that's why people make the joke and say, oh, well, but the, uh, that's what I saw on the internet. The internet said so. Right? Because it's, it's a joke to, to just say, oh, because I saw this on the internet, it's true. It's a joke. Because there's all kinds of people, all kinds of opinions, all kinds of stupidity, all kinds of ignorance being repeated, being, you know, just, just generated or whatever. Everyone's got their own motive. Some people like spreading lies just, for the, just to see what happens with it. Some people like spreading rumors and, and just and gossiping and, and throwing stuff out there as if it's truth. They're called trolls. People who just want, it, just want to see a reaction. And they purposefully deceive just to see, hey, how, <laughs> look at all these stupid people. And they're stupid people. They're just, just spreading and sharing everything just because they saw someone else say it and they like what it says or they agree with what it says, even though there could be zero facts behind it. Zero factual evidence. 
All I'm saying is that people are the same and they have been the same all throughout time. Now, does that make every person a liar? The Bible says, well, yeah, let, you know, man be, let God be true, but every man a liar. Right? That's why we can trust God's word completely. Now, again, I mean, you want to believe something about Nimrod? I don't really care, but, but I wouldn't devote very much time and resources and energy into studying something, someone that's not talked about. We will look at all the mentions of Nimrod in the Bible today. We already read through Genesis 10, verses 8 and 9, and Cush begat Nimrod. So what does the Bible say about Nimrod? He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Okay, a mighty one. Strong, mighty, right? Some people will say, oh, he became a giant and all this other nonsense. And, and they like to, people who come up with that stuff, they just want to rewrite the Bible. They see words and they say, you know what, this really should have said, they're, they're Bible correctors, so watch out for that. Um, they don't trust that God has preserved his word and they know better and they really want this to mean something else than what it actually says. So they'll jump through hoops to try to get it to say something different. But it says, Cush began, or begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So a mighty, a strong person in the earth, right? Uh, maybe a, a, a strong leader, someone that people followed because he was mighty. Verse number nine, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Okay. Nimrod's a mighty person and a mighty hunter. Does that tell you that he was some wicked, horrible, evil wretch of a man? Nope. It just says he was a hunter. Hey, I'm a hunter. I don't know how mighty I am. I'm, I don't think I'm a wimp, but, but, you know, Nimrod was a mighty one in the earth, according to the Bible, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. First Chronicles chapter 1, verse number 10 says, And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be mighty upon the earth. So again, we see no extra information here. He began to be a mighty one upon the earth. Okay, let's look at the last mention of Nimrod. That's right. We saw Genesis 10, 1 Chronicles 1. Now let's look at the last mention of Nimrod. Micah chapter 5, verse number 6. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. It tells us nothing about Nimrod. It's just talking about the land of Nimrod. That's it. This is what the Bible says about Nimrod. And it says, um, oh wait, gen yeah, in uh, verse number 10, it doesn't mention his name, but it's, it's, in, it's in the same context of, of Genesis 10. It says in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalni in the land of Shinar. So we also know that he was a king because he had a kingdom. <coughs> the being of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and uh, um, Akkad, and Kalni in the land of Shinar. Nimrod was a king. He was a mighty one in the earth, and he was a hunter. This is what we know to be the truth about Nimrod from the Bible. Anything else that people want to tell you and go into all this extra secret wisdom and, and oh, yeah, but the apocryphal books of this or the, you know, all these other writings, the book of Enoch, whatever, whatever, whatever they want to go to, it's not scripture, okay? Maybe it's true. I don't know. Maybe he was a wicked man. Don't know. The Bible says this and this only about him. Now, um, we don't even know for sure if, if Nimrod was king during the building of the Tower of Babel. Now, we could see he was the king of Babel, um, at least at one time, because it says his kingdom included Babel. But we don't know for sure um, that he was the king during the, during the, the building of the Tower. Because the Tower happened pretty short amount of time after the Flood. Because... That is before God confounded their language and separated. And we're going to see that a lot more about the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 next week. But basically, they're all just stuck in one place. They don't spread out over the earth. They just kind of want to stick together. And um, they decide to build this tower it, within somewhat of a short period of time. We don't, again, we don't, know that, we don't have the exact timing of it. But um, when they started to do this, God said, uh-uh. You're not doing this. And he confounded their language so that they couldn't work together. And that kind of drove them off. They couldn't understand each other. They were speaking different things. But, but certain groups of people could understand each other. Say, oh, we're all speaking the same language. Okay, well, let's just go over here and just do our own thing and start our own cities. And they started to spread out. And when, uh, when it's mentioned here that Nimrod was a king, 
he, he was, his kingdom contained multiple places. So they had already sp spread to this point where it's saying he was a king. Was he, was he the king of Babel during the building of, of the tower? Don't know. Maybe he was. And that's one of the reasons why people say he was a real wicked man because it was a wicked thing to try to work your way to heaven and, and, and build that tower of Babel. But there's really not a lot of evidence to, to, to show that one way or the other with that guy. Um, and again, I'm not just trying to defend Nimrod. I'm just saying, I'm just saying be careful what you spend your time reading and researching and finding all this extra special knowledge um, with. So let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Uh, we're going to skip down because we already read all this stuff with um, Canaan and Ham. Uh, verse number 21 says, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem. And that's going to list off Shem. Now, notice too, don't, I want to get this in just a second. It makes a special mention that he's the father of all the children of Eber. So Eber is kind of pulled out as, as being somewhat unique or special. Um, verse number 22, the children of Shem, Elam and Asher and Arphaxad and Lud and Aram. And the children of Aram, Uz and Hol and Gether and Mash. And Arphaxad begat Selah and Selah begat Eber. So Eber is born a little bit further down the line. He's not just direct, a direct son of Shem, right? And the reason why I'm pointing out Eber is because that's, that, that man Eber is where the, the term Hebrew comes from. So the Hebrews, just like um, you know, the, 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 from Shem comes the Semites. We saw from Japheth were the Gentiles. Eber is the father of the Hebrews. So if you think of Eber, you can also put it like an H of a Heber. Eber could be spelled both ways. And then Hebrews is, is someone who's descended from Eber. Okay? And that's where the, the Hebrews come from. So when we talk about Israel, we're talking about a specific group of people. We're talking about the Jews. We're talking about even a more specific people. And we're talking about the Hebrews. We're talking about a more broad group of people. Right? Now, that being said, as a literal definition, when you look in the context, especially in the New Testament, there's a lot of interchanging going on. Because someone who's a Jew is also of Israel. And someone who's of Israel is also of Eber, just because it, that's the way descendants-wise. So when he's talking to the Hebrews, he's really talking to the Jews, to the Israelites, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty much, I've looked this up, it's pretty much used synonymously. He's not, you know, the Bible is not using that much of a distinction between all these groups. Because I see some people are really strict. There's a one guy that came and visited our church, actually, that, that was really like, like, trying to get right down to the, to the family, the definition of these things. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's, it, it's, under, it's good to understand where these things come from, but it's not going to have that much impact on, on doctrine of when you're reading the Hebrews or the Jews or Israel in the New Testament. They're, they're, they're basically used synonymously. So, um, but I wanted to point that out about Eber. So now let's look at... Um, where were we? Verse, verse number 25, right? It says, And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, Peleg here, I've heard it taught before. It says, For in his days was the earth divided. And I've heard it taught that, um, you know, oh, this could mean some big catastrophic event happened to the earth. You know, the earth was literally like divided and that's where we get the, um, oh, I forgot what that's called, like the great continental divide from and things like that in the, in the ocean floor. But I, I don't believe, it. I think there's a much simpler explanation than that because you, you don't see, I mean, that's really literally just taking one phrase in the Bible and just applying it to whatever you want. And you cannot, you definitely can't say that dogmatically, but I think there's a much, much, much simpler um, explanation for why he's called Peleg and, and the earth being divided. Now, Peleg was born based on chapter 11, I'm not going to go through the math, 100 year, uh, 101 years after the flood. 
Okay? That's when he was born. So 101 years go by after the flood, and there's this event of the earth being divided. What I believe is that the earth being divided that he was named after is the event of God confounding the language at the Tower of Babel and dividing the earth into nations. Because before that point, there was one family, one group of people. And they were all working together and they, were, you know, they ended up doing this wicked thing with the Tower of Babel. And God didn't like that. And when we read through this, look at verse number um, 32, the last verse of the chapter. He says, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So nations. Before, before the Tower of Babel, there was one nation. They were all working together. God confounded their language so that they would spread apart and they, they formed different nations from these different families and different tongues. And in another section I don't have in my notes where it says, you know, these are their, oh, verse 31, these are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, and in their lands, after their nations. So this is how they're divided, right? They're divided by, we could speak the same language, so we're going to form a nation over here. We're of this family, of this lineage. We speak the same language, we're going to be a nation. And that's, in, I mean, think about it. This is even the way it is today. Now, a lot of people have, are starting to speak common language, you know, English especially. But in Poland, they speak Polish, right? In Latvia, they speak Latvian. In Russia, what do they speak? Russian. In Germany, hey, guess what? They speak German. In England, English. This is how nations are divided. I mean, you speak your language. You're, you, you know, generally, you'll have, you'll have a, a lineage, a family, because people tend to stay in the, in the area that they were born and grew up in. All throughout time, now things have changed a little bit because of ease of transportation and modern technology and things like that. You know, move around a lot easier. But generally, I mean, this is, this is how things have been for almost all of history. And... We see that word in the last verse, the nations were divided after the flood. And it makes sense. Okay, the Tower of Babel, sure, why not, would have been built around the 100 years after the flood. Right? I mean, that's, that's a good amount of time for people to come together and start building this work. Um, Nimrod was, was, much, um, was born more directly in, in the lineage. And if he, had, if he was one of the kings after, where, where Babel was one of the nations... Right? We see he was all, at the time he had a kingdom, the earth was already divided, for sure. I mean, he might have been before that, but it doesn't matter. Um, if he was still alive, um, you know, it, what I'm saying is that the, the event of the Tower of Babel couldn't have happened very much farther, even if it happened later in time than, uh, than 100 years. It couldn't have been that much time. So it makes sense that, okay, 101 years, when Peleg was born, 100 years after the flood is probably the time the, the, the whole event with the Tower of Babel happened. And there's one more um, reference to the nations being divided. We saw in verse 25, that's, that's why Peleg was given his name for in, in his days was the earth divided. Verse 32, the nations were divided in the earth after the flood. And then in chapter 11, verse number 9, it says, therefore is the name of it called Babel because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. That's where the God scattered them. That's when they actually became other nations because before that they weren't scattered. They're all in one place. You can't have, you're not going to have multiple nations all in the same place. They all had to be scattered to do that. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes God steps in when he doesn't like what's going on. And um, one of the things that I think about with that event of the Tower of Babel is um, when he told his disciples, when Jesus Christ said to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel in every creature. But what did they do? His disciples, they didn't do that. They all stuck at Jerusalem, right? They all stayed in that place. And we see from the book of Acts that God actually, you know, the persecution came and once the persecution came, then they went out. Then they started to spread. Then they started to scatter and, and to, to, to go out to other places. And it took that little bit of a fire under their butt to go out and, and do what Jesus had already told them to do. But you get comfortable in one place and, you know, 
I think it's a similar thing with the Tower of Babel. They're all in one place. Like, hey, we don't want to be scattered. We want to be stuck together. We want to do these, these great and mighty things. God's like, uh-uh. No, I got something else for you to do. I want you to go inhabit the earth. I want you to have nations. And that's why, one of the reasons why we're against a one world government. God created nations. God wanted separate nations. He was fine with the different languages. We don't all need to speak the same language. We don't all need to come together and form one big world government. God doesn't want that. He likes having different nations. And there's a good purpose for that. Because at least right now, if you don't like the way a nation is living and doing and everything else, you could try to move somewhere else. Back in the days of Israel, they didn't like being in a heathen land and heathen gods and all this other stuff. They could join themselves and become one of Israel and worship the true God. What about when America was for, you know, early days of America? So many people immigrated from other countries because, hey, this is a land of freedom. I like what this is all about. I'm going to join to be myself part of this country. And we flourish. And, and, and when you have different nations, you can do that. But what do you do when everybody's under one rule and you say, I don't like this rule. Okay, where are you going to go? It's all the same thing. And we know that the devil is ultimately the ruler of this world anyways. And you get all that power and authority in one place, good night, that's going to be, it's going to be horrible. And it's going to happen. And that's when God's going to step in Right? Very shortly after that happens, just like very shortly after they started building the Tower of Babel, God's going to step in and say, no, no, I've had enough. And you're not going to do these things. And that's why I'm not worried. You know, we, you read all the stuff with technology these days about people um, wanting to upload their brains into a computer so they can live forever and, you know, all this transhumanism and all this other nonsense. It ain't going to happen. It won't. Even if it's possible technologically, which it, it probably is, right? I mean, I mean, you could probably get to a point, humanity, would just to, to, to have enough understanding to be able to do something like that and have it work. But I've got news for you. God won't let it happen. He won't. He's, it's, it's not going to happen. So I'm, I don't worry myself with that. I mean, it's foolish and wicked to, to, to want to do that and to push for that and, and everything else. And these people are going to burn in hell that are believing this transhumanism thing. See, they, they want eternal life, but they don't like the way that you, get, you need to get it. They don't want to believe that there is a God. They don't want to believe that there is someone who has authority over them and someone that can tell them what's right and what's wrong. They want to be their own gods. But there is a God and eternal life is easy to receive. In fact, I already have it. Put my faith in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for your words. God, I pray that you would please just help us to continue to learn more about you. God, not to, and that we also wouldn't get too um, caught up with a lot of these other teachings that they might sound real interesting and, and people will try to, to hook you with um, getting extra knowledge and insight on things like Nimrod and Gog and Magog, dear Lord. And um, ultimately, there's just no scripture backing. Help us to be wise and discerning in the things that we listen to, the things that we hear and read, dear Lord, that um, everything is scrutinized against the truth, which is found in the Bible. And um, that we would just make sure that the things that we hold fast to be true are, are verified or come from directly from, the, from your word, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.